Guten Abend und herzlich willkommen. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass Sie heute alle wieder im Museum sind und hier zum Künstlervortrag von Matt Mulliken gekommen sind. Es sind äh, doch sehr viele Menschen, ein ungewöhnliches Bild für uns alle nach dieser langen Zeit der Pandemie. Ich hoffe, dass wir die Zahlen langsam steigern können und Sie wieder zu uns ins Museum kommen können. Also das ist ein guter Anfang, würde ich sagen. Gerne möchte ich zuerst Matt Mulliken neben mir begrüßen und ich wechsle dafür in die englische Sprache. So, hello Matt, thank you for coming to Münster, for presenting your work and for being involved in the process of the restoration. Um, as I know you are quite busy these days, so I'm very happy that you are with us. Mm. I would like to briefly say a few words about the process of the restoration we are going through and to introduce you as an artist. Matt Mulliken participated in Skulpturprojekte 1987 with this large-scale ground-based sculpture we see here in the atrium. In response to significant urban changes at the former location, the museum and the University of Münster have worked together with Matt to finding another location for the sculpture. As part of this relocation, the stone slabs were brought here to the museum for the public restoration. And we will continue with this process about two weeks more until we can finish it. Together with Matt, we had a dialogue about the damages and the new location. After thinking about the work and also the context of Skulpturprojekte, we decided that the restoration is carried out um, as a preserving process, so we did not produce new slabs of stone. Therefore, fissures and flaws hadn't been glued, but um, not concealed, so you can see all these damages still when they are uncovered. This process left imperfections visible and is documenting change as well as showing the biography of the work. In addition, Matt and his studio team are currently producing the so-called rubbings you can see now. So all stone slabs are covered now in the moment, only one is uncovered in the middle. This is reflecting the sculpture in another medium. I am sure that Matt will talk about this in his lecture extensively. Once the rubbings are ready to present, we will hang them on the walls around here in the atrium until the reinstallation of the work, which is starting in mid-August this year at the new Pharma campus of the university. As we all know, projects like this can't be realized without strong and reliable partners. This is the moment I send my warm regards and a warm welcome and thanks to our generous sponsor, Prilux, who made it possible that we could make that process of restoration. So um, without them, it would not have been possible. And I think it's a great pleasure to have them with us. But there have been more people involved. Therefore, I want to thank Thorsten Mark from the building department of the university and Eckhard Klut, um, who is head curator at the university. I am also very happy to welcome the architects of the Burhoff company for doing the construction management and Gantad Wiemöller, who took care of the structural engineering calculations. Both companies are doing this free of charge. Thank you very much for this engagement in the arts. Furthermore, I would like to thank the restoration company Schmiede, who is doing this here, and the academic staff of the Pharma Campus, who is kindly in dialogue with us about the new location. And lastly, I want to thank the principal of the university, Professor Johannes Wessels. He and our museum director, Hermann Arnold, who is just on the right side, right hand to me, signed a new agreement this Monday, which will ensure that Matt Mulliken's work will remain for at least, attention, the next 30 years. We have never before been able to anchor such a long term in a contract for Skulpturprojekte before. This is a good template for the negotiations for Bruce Naumann's work, which is planned to be rebuilt within the next few years. So now I want to shift after this long introduction to the and have the focus on Matt as an artist. 
Matt Mulliken is concerned with systems of knowledge, meaning, and signification, and the relationship between the perception of us as um, viewers and the reality. He is working in different media, for example, paintings, films, flags, sculptures, drawings, neons, stained glass works, photographs, light boxes, and the so-called rubbings. So I hope I didn't forget anything. The stone. <laughs> the stone. <laughs> we didn't mention stone. <laughs> <laughs> with his signs, which we also see here around us, he confronts us with the fundamental questions about human existence. And I think this is a point he will talk about later. Matt's work and his, his exhibition activity is very extensive. Therefore, I would like to pick out only some very exceptional exhibitions. For example, the comprehensive solo show um, in 2018 at the Pirelli Hangar with the title The Feeling of Things, which took place in Milan, or the show at Haus der Kunst München in 2011. Since yesterday, his latest show, A Chart Between Five Worlds, is open in Bucharest at Mare, from where he came today. So, Matt, thank you for coming. We are thrilled to hear yes. your lecture and to have well, you here. Well, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, when I made this sculpture, it was the largest piece I had done to that at that time. I have not done, and I still haven't done very many that are larger than this. Um, well, I was just reflecting on my first, one of my first visits to the sculpture project to meet up with Casper uh, Koenig and um, Ulrich Wilmes and Friedrich Meschede were also there and they were like the team for the 87 sculpture project. And uh, as, as, as would be appropriate, Casper and I went out on bicycles touring around. And then he said, there's this one site out at the university. And as we're riding our bikes, he says, you know, it's a really difficult site. I've tried, and I've been trying to get artists to use the site, and no one has done it. And he was dressing this site for me. He was trying to get me to use it. Uh, it was in between um, th four buildings, uh, inorganic and organic chemistry, a library and isotopic, uh, uh, isotopic stuff. So you had all of these in this one courtyard and it was such a weird sci-fi type environment because being laboratories you had all these vents coming out of the ground and you had all of these uh, fire, fire hoses, hydrants, all popping out of this perfectly green uh, plaza. And so I was already had started to, to, to make smaller pieces in etched stone. Uh, at the time, in the mid-80s, uh, I had made flags and posters, and um, I had worked with, of course, in the 70s, I'd worked with uh, film and video, and also with photography, and, and did lots of drawings. But I was very much into the applied arts. So I was do, beginning, I did ceramics, I did uh, tapestries. I was interested in, in the kind of the arts that would be incorporated into architecture. Um, the very, um, the, the stone tablet is, it goes way back. I mean, people go around the world and they are discovering stone tablets that go back, uh, you know, thousands of years. Uh, so it's been an art form of, of, for a long, long, long time. And that's one of the reasons why I'm attracted to it. Uh, just an attempt to define what art is for myself and what could be for others. So this, this going back in time to, to these, these tablets that, you know, like uh, you would, might discover in a jungle somewhere. Uh, in fact, I have a, a house in upstate New York in, um, in Berlin, New York. Before I moved to Berlin, Germany, I was living in Berlin, New York, oddly. Uh, and we live on a, on a street, Comstock Hollow Road, which has one other house on it, and it goes for miles. The street goes for miles. So there's no one around. Uh, in the 19th century, it was, and the 18th century, it was busy. 
all the, all the forest around were fields. Across the road, up the hill, you go to a cemetery in the middle of the woods. And, um, and it's, their gravestones are just splattered around with these, with these trees growing through them. And you have one of our favorites, is uh, just the name P. Moon. But you would have the birth date, the death date, the name of the person, and it would be in pieces or it would be surrounding, you know, just, just around and with trees everywhere. It, it was kind of, rem it's a remarkable place. And in, in, in a sense, I am talking about that with this piece. Now this piece has nothing, it is not in the same context as that cemetery. Uh, that cemetery will not be touched. It's on private land. Uh, there's no flags there. Most cemeteries have American flags in them, but not this one. This one's deserted. And, uh, and I'm kind of interested in what we leave behind uh, as, a, as a culture uh, and as, uh, as, as, as a species, in a way. We're, now we're talking about the end of the world a lot. And uh, so you have this issue of stone lasting a long time. I had been making um, works in, in fabric and in paper, but when I put it in stone, people paid attention much more than if I didn't. I remember I, the first stone I made was about, was small, but the, in a gallery setting was about this big. And when people saw it, it was of the cosmology. And when people saw it, they all, they looked at it like they gave it reverence. You know, this is an etched stone tablet, and I'm going to give it some, you know, it's important just because of how heavy it is. And it would weigh 500 pounds, maybe 1,000 pounds. So weight, uh, the physical weight would, would, would somehow describe the conceptual weight of the piece. So that's one thing, and that's what I was interested in, how if you put a sign on a flag, or if you put a sign in, on your clothing, or if you put a sign in a notebook, or if you put a sign on a painting, on gouache, a watercolor, they're all very, very different. They represent different things. The different forms are like adjectives to the signs. Now, that was, that's just about the materiality of this piece. Um, the rubbing part, which is the second piece you see here, um, the first rubbing, I, I, the, I learned about rubbings for the first time in the, I guess, 83 or 4, and two, 82, 83, 84, something like that. I went up to the Boston Museum it, 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 up, up in Boston, and they had a little display of a Chinese relief and then a rubbing from that relief. And I had already was etching into stained glass. I was already doing that. So I saw the relief, and I said, I have reliefs at home. And so I got home, and I made a rubbing from it, and that was just like, oh my God. I can make, because a rubbing is a print, a drawing, and a painting. These are on canvas, and they're all going to be stretched, so they automatically become paintings. But I could make a hundred of these if, if, if I wanted, uh, because it is one big print. So it's all of those, and it's also something else about the rubbing is that it's a, it, it's a, it's a representation of what's underneath it. And it has to do, and I think of it like a retinal image, like the shadow on the back of our eye. It's a kind of a similar thing. So that's a shadow of what's underneath. And so there's a, almost, it's not photographic, but there, but there is something to it like that. Like when you see this one, and you see the cracks that are going through it, and it adds so much of a dimension that, that, that it, you get to see that this is becoming a document for what, what is underneath. Underneath, they all look like this. This is the uncovered, you know, the rubbing is someplace else. And it's just barely enough to, um, to register on, on, the, on, the, on the canvas, and the cracks are going through it. Uh, so this is, this is how the process is. People generally ask me, so how do you make the rubbings? When I make them in my studio, we have a process where we cut into masonite. And when you cut into something, it comes out, because where is it going to go? If you cut into it, it has to go somewhere, so it comes out, it makes a ridge, and that ridge is becoming a line. Uh, but this is a very different process. This has all been sandblasted. In today's world, this would all be done digitally 
but not back then. So everything I, I drew, the, everything here I drew. I, I, was in, I was at the stone factory drawing this all up. Tracing, I brought a skeleton. That's a real skeleton that I bought in 1977. Uh, I bought a, a human skeleton. And, this, and, and you can't buy them now. As, as, a, as an artist, I'm not allowed to buy a skeleton. You have to be a doctor to buy a skeleton uh, today. But the skeleton that I got, I unpacked at the Kitchen Center for Performing Arts in New York in 77, and I unpacked it in front of an audience. And I put it, it's very similar to this, just laying it on the ground. See, here's the skull. I didn't want to go with the emblem of the skull, it's on its side. And, but it's, it, it's all accurate, it, it, it is really, truly uh, a shadow of the actual bones. And the people that export the skeleton, the two countries at the time that exported the uh, skeletons were Mexico and India. Um, they, that, so if you wanted to buy one, I don't know, I forgot what I paid, but it must have been about $150 or $200, and I bought it just through the phone book, you know, there's a phone, we didn't have the internet back then, so I was just looking in the phone book and there was this, a medical supply place and I just bought the skeleton. But that, that is uh, representing the body. Now, this, this, uh, this work is all from 1987. One of the funny things is the last time I talked about this piece like this was in 87. And at the opening, you would have I would be on, and I was on the stone, standing, because they're all, they're all touching, so one could walk on it. And I was reading it to the audience as they came by. And you'd have buses of people, because Casper or, or the team had organized buses so, you, so they could get a tour. So I was ready for them, and I gave a lecture on the stone for the different buses that were going through on the opening day in 1987 and uh, I talked about how it all connects up. Um, and so the whole thing is separated into many, many different areas. One of the interesting areas is, is, is these, th these are the signs. The signs I started in um, 75. I, I started uh, representing these signs. And um, here, when you, and, and, and it's kind of uncanny because this is so long before. But, you know, the thing about it is that, it, you know, it, when you see the iPhone and you see this, this proportion and how I was designing these things was as an interface design. I was interested in the way things are connected up and how things are represented. I get a certain pushback on my work because I invent a language and I'm very creative. I'm not really real. I am my own person. I'm, I represent the subjective. And, and I get this. Uh, I'm the fool on the hill, you might say, over there. I'm not here, I'm over there. And, but, but when you see this, and you see this, and then you see the phone, you say, well, you know, there is a relationship uh, as to what I'm doing and what I'm thinking. Uh, it's not just about, um, it's not just about my personal language. It has to do with the, the language and the creative process and contemporary life. So the part that I get in the most trouble for, the reason that they think I'm the fool on the hill, is to do with my cosmology. And that's this over here. Um, and I'm just going to point and talk, so then you can see what it is. Um, this would go together, and there's a circle right here. And the, where I'm standing, there's a circle here, you have the three, three circles there, and that, three sec, that's, that, that is life, that is fate, and that is death. That is death in the figure, the head and the body, and that's life in the figure. I am on the, in the middle of the ball. See, there it is again. This is the same sign. I am the middle of the ball, and that is space, and this half circle is time. So this is my life where I'm standing. That's before I was born, and this is after I die. So it contextualizes life. There is God, and then that's a demon and an angel stretching a dead man's soul, and uh, the soul seems to be going down to hell. The hell figure is, is the squatting man almost in an embryonic uh, shape. 
he's, he, he, he's looking like he's, uh, he's, he's about to be born. And this is his brain, the, the hole in the head there. And then he is, behind him are the angels before birth. Now, um, angels before birth, demon and angel, God, and then God. This is God. And so, uh, it, it's a cycle. So I live, I die, death, the demon and the angel pull my soul to hell and to, to God at the same time. So this is the way the cosmology goes now. And then they, they, they meet up before birth and then I'm reborn. So it's like a big generator. Now when I tell this to people, and I can get into great detail about this, uh, I've gotten in trouble because people think that I'm trying to convert them. I have nothing invested in this as being an actual cosmology. It is not a cosmology. It's not even a cosmogony, which represents a cosmology. It is because a cosmology is social. It, it, is, it is an agreement between people. It's political because it's agreement between people. This is not, this is not a cosmology but I represent it and I get in trouble for it. I was in this, an exhibition uh, it, at the same time as I did the sculpture project. It was called uh, uh, Spiritual, Spiritual the, uh, and Abstract Art at the County Art Museum. And uh, my father was in the show. My father was a painter. Uh, he was in the show and I was in the show. And it was really about the spiritual aspect of things uh, going back a hundred years to 150 years and going and spending a lot of time with uh, Kandinsky and the early modernism. But the, 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 what I, and I got in trouble again and I keep on saying this. There was a dealer, a very fancy dealer who, who asked me to rep, he, he told me he wanted to represent me. Uh, but he, he, he was drunk and he was like a really high-end, I was very, I was honored that he was interested in even thinking about working with me. And he says, I will work with you, but I do not want to work with this. So he would only work with the part of my work that had to do with semiotics and with signs and, po and flags and maybe even down there, maybe, I don't think so, but maybe the evolution too. But he would not work with the cosmology because it's, it's too, t it's, just too difficult. Uh, it, it's tough because it, it's so vulnerable and it's weird. And so I get, I feel like I always get in trouble for this, but it's also kept me young because it has not been assimilated. People don't think they can understand it. It's, 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 it's a complicated thing. But this answers the question, where was I before I was born? Why did they happen while I live my life? And what happens after I die? Now, if you want to go back in time, uh, you go back in time a thousand years, all cultures did this. They all did it. Every, every culture on the planet. It doesn't matter if you're Hopi Indians or if you're, uh, you know, like if you're in Middle Europe or if you're in South America or if you're in New Guinea or if you, it doesn't matter where you are, you're dealing with this subject matter. The subject matter is primal. It's primal subject matter. I'm one of the very few uh, uh, conceptual artists or international artist or whatever dealing with this stuff and it's been difficult for me uh, I, 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 I sense uh, Peter Kogler brought his class to a show I had at the Lentz Museum the Lentos Museum and I was talking about the cosmology I had all these models describing it and he could tell that everybody all of his students stepped back as I was talking and then stepped back again because I was making them very nervous with this subject matter and uh, so he said, you're a conceptual artist, right? Yes. And this is, you're not trying to say, you're not trying to convert us or anything, right? Yeah. And this is a model. It's not real. It's not supposed to re be real. It exists as a model only. Yes. But in a way, I lost the students. They, they, I scared them. I've had arguments with my own dealers where this work still frightens them because it's not formal. In fact, the formalism involved here, I don't know if, if this would be accepted, uh, this protage thing, because it's so emblematic of archaeology and so emblematic of, uh, 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 of, of this other time that it might, be, it might be trouble. So I'm not a formalist. Uh, I'm the opposite, whatever the opposite would be. 
What is the opposite of a formalist, um, a subjectivist, uh, someone who's involved with their psyche, someone involved with the mind, someone who's involved with their spirituality, whatever that is, or soul or crap like this. So that's what this, this is that. And then you have, there's uh, heaven, God, angels before birth, life, fate, demon and angel, death, and hell. So these are all the parts of that. And that, so these are the eight signs. I made these signs um, as flags. They're huge red, black, and white banners. I had them at Berlin Alexanderplatz uh, in the middle. They look very fascistic, but there are these flags. And uh, I've, I've, I've represented them continuously since, uh, since I started. This is, um, right now, I've been working as an artist for 50 years. This is my, uh, eight, 71 is about when I really started doing what I'm doing now. Uh, I was not even in college yet. I was very young. Uh, I, was go I went to California Institute of the Arts. I studied with John Baldessari. So uh, my, my fellow artists, the first person I met when I was going to school was James Welling. We met in the hallway waiting for Jack Goldstein's class. And um, David Sally and uh, uh, Eric Fischel and a, a, a bunch of people, and we all got to know each other. We all moved to New York, and that all started. But back then, is, this is so, it's 50, I, I'm 70 this year, so I was just 20 years old when I started really uh, playing around, uh, be, being, being, being an artist. So that this all, and this work is from 87, which is like, I don't know, 37, 36 years ago. And, um, and then the, the signs go back uh, close to 45 years ago. So here you have the signs having to do with, uh, this is communication, and uh, in the gen these are all signs lifted from an airport uh, logos. In fact, this in both, both of these panels here have to do with, you know, there's the parking of the car, there's the taxi, there's the nursery, there's the bathroom. There's the parking, there's the no parking, there's the cigarettes, there's customs, which I saw this morning because I, I saw that sign. And uh, one of the reasons I use signs is because when I was a, uh, a child, uh, one of my teachers, I might have been 10 years old, but she said, underneath all objects there is a word. That means in the object there is a word and I'm dyslexic and I have a hard time with language. And I just didn't believe her. I, 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 and, and in a way, that disbelief is the person who came up with this sign stuff, what I was interested in. Because I can point to this and you can know what I'm pointing to and you never use the word. The word never enters your head. It's a different part of the brain where, where, where pictures are than words. And there is a, a famous woman who said that she thinks in pictures, she's autistic, Temple Grandin Smith, she's a, she's a, she's a famous uh, 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 veterinarian, a very famous uh, person working with animals. And she says that in her head, she works, she thinks in pictures. She thinks in pictures. So this is all pictures, so maybe there's something to do with that. And she knows, she, and the implication is that we think, the other people, the normal people, think in words. Now, I don't think I think in pictures, and I don't think I think, I know I don't think in words, and I don't think I think in pictures. So if I don't think in pictures, and I don't think in words, what do I think in? How do I think? And, and, and it's anyone's game for this. Any, I think it's more related to feelings. I, I think that, I think you, uh, can, feelings are much quicker and you can distinguish in yourself the, 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 the feeling of, of, uh, uh, of objects. That's why the name of the show at the Hangar Pekoka was the feeling of things. Because all things have feelings. All places have feelings. We are different. Our chemistry changes moment to moment depending on where we are. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous here. I close my eyes when I lecture because I think I have attention deficit disorder. So when, if I'm looking at you and I'm trying to have all of these long threads of, uh, of meaning, it's very difficult for me to string them together if my eyes are open. It's easier if my eyes are closed. So here we are with pictures. 
and, um, and these pictures are appropriated. And I did that in the late 70s where I simply lifted pictures that were in the culture already, but they were not, they were simply descriptive. So, and here you have, uh, these are more abstract. There's bottom, top, time, fast, slow, temperature, heavy, light. Um, there's blood, there's, fi there's liquid, fire, uh, volume, uh, light. So this is, these are like the elemental uh, versions, and this is more contextual. So then that's the top row here. So these two could go together, those two could go together, those four could go together, and they could be single pieces. They could, they could, they could go like that. So now we have um, the sign area is in the top. Now, the library in the, um, where the sculpture is was... Uh, on the side of this that was on this side of, of this piece. So this means that it was flipped. Uh, this is, uh, this is on, the, on the side that's outside. So this is, this is towards the language. And then you had organic chemistry on that side, inorganic chemistry on that side, and isotopic on that side. So in a way, I'm orienting the stone to what was happening in the buildings. So now we go to the next row, which are these four very large signs. Um, if I am not a formalist and I am a subjectivist, maybe, is that what you, you could call a subjectivist? That would be, this is my sign for subjectivity. It's the t I have five basic concepts in my work. I have subject, I have sign, I have the world framed, which is not here, but that's the world unframed, and then the elements. Uh, where would world framed be? I guess it would be, have to be, it's not represented in this chart. It's in the middle, the, the square in the center of, this is the world framed, it's this square here. But, um, so this is the subjective. So that's, again, close to the cosmology. That's very, very close to the cosmology. In a way, the cosmology represents a kind of a belief structure that uh, orients your, your, yourself. It's what you believe in that's not necessarily physically real. It's, you know, it could be your religion, it could also be your love of certain things, you know, what holds you together. That would be the cosmology and that would be, and this is, this is the subjective. And, and you can see that it's a circle. The earlier versions of the head were with a brain. And I took the brain out and I put the circle there. So then you have the circle here, the circle in, and you see here, this is a, a sign that you're holding, uh, like a placard, that's the handle, and then that's the circle, and then it's inside this other circle with a circle. So this placard here represents the stone. And here's the stone that you're holding. So that is the form that's the, that's the symbolic uh, representation of the form that it is on. So that's that. And then here is the world unframed, which is the everyday. This is the part of, uh, of life which you never really, the, the part of life you don't remember. Uh, one of the things, I've been telling this story because I was just in Los Angeles uh, uh, just two weeks ago, not even, and I was in where I went to elementary school in Santa Monica. And uh, I was with my brother and I told my brother the story of, of going to the cafeteria in, and I must have been 10 years old or, or nine or 10 years old. And I, uh, and I sat down, I was early getting my food. I, I actually had a bag, so I didn't need to wait in line at the cafeteria. I had a bag of food. I had a sandwich and whatever. So I sat down at the table, and it was a sunny day, and I was looking up at the sun, and I was looking at, there's a building right here, and the sun is behind it, and, it's, and, I, and, and there's not that many people around yet, because I'm early. I, I, got into the ca I got there early. And, and I put up my finger, and I said, I will never forget this. And, and I had never forgotten it. 
And I said I would never forget this because it was a no nothing. It was, a, it was a, as, as normal a day as you could ever, ever think. It was a stupid, normal, regular day. But my philosophy was, you know, uh, that if you just look at it, you will remember it. And so I, put, I remember I put my finger up and I said, I'll never forget this. This must have been in, I don't know, 1962. And I just put my finger up and I said this. But this is like a childhood philosophy that, 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 that you see in my work here. Uh, and that, that, but that, that place where I was when I said I will never forget that, that is, that's the real world. That's pretty close to it. So that's the normal life. I have a birth to death list where I list details from an imaginary life and that's all the stuff like uh, from here. I take photographs. I've been taking photographs. There's a book of my photography going back a long way and uh, most of the photographs are of stupid stuff that is around me, about my around my life. So it's really, photo I'm taking photographs from the bed, from the couch, from the dining room table, from the restaurant, from where I'm sitting, uh, taking photographs from where I'm sitting, uh, it, 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 and then also where I'm not sitting, like in the bathroom or, or in the kitchen, as, being, as preparing food and so forth. So that's here. And now this is the elements. So this is not about the, uh, the, the world, it's about what makes the world. So this would be, the elements would be the marble, would be the oil, would be my blood, would be my nails, would be the gravel on the floor, would be the plaster on the wall, would be the cloth that's on my jacket, the, 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 the cloth that my jeans are made of. It's the materiality. So this is materiality with, and, and it's an extreme, in the extreme version, materiality without meaning. So it ceases to exist in any way. So that is, that is, so pure materiality has no meaning. And it does not, and, we, and as soon as we see that it exists, it disappears. It's no longer what, that, what I'm saying it is. And that over there, the subject, is meaning without materiality. That's the cosmology. That's the mind. That's all, but the, see, the mind has weight. The mind is, no, mind doesn't have, the brain has weight, the mind doesn't. So uh, I'm interested in the mind. Um, the uh, the uh, Philip Guston, who is an artist that I've really become very enamored with in the last five years, he gave a lecture uh, uh, about painting uh, in the late 60s, he and another artist, and, they at, and the audience asked them both, what is a painting? And the, and, 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 and the other person said, okay, it's, you get a canvas, it's, it's, two, two, it's like five square feet, and then you get a quart of red paint or blue paint, and you get a roller, and you roll it on, and that is a painting. Just paint on canvas, there's no meaning there. It's just materiality. That's the formal way of looking at things. And then Gustin said to him, that means nothing. Painting doesn't exist. Uh, when you see a painting, it's not there. It doesn't exist physically. It does it, it, the important thing is not how the painting exists physically, but how it exists mentally. That's what's important. What's important about this work is not that it's all granite or that it's all cloth. It's what you see, which is a, which is a, a distilling device and a microscope. So we, I can see that, or the bones. The bones are not there. They don't exist there. There's no, there's no animals over here. They, they're not there. They, 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 they're in our minds. They only exist. All of this stuff only exists in our minds. So he said, painting is a, is, is a, exists in the mind only. The rest of it is secondary, in the mind. And then he, he says that Leonardo da Vinci said that paintings, painting is of the mind. It's because it is not physically there. The Mona Lisa is an image and it is only an image and it only exists as an image. And the image that we see through our eyes and in our brains is, is closer to what it is than the canvas itself. So that's, a, that's an, a completely reverse. It's not a formal way of looking at things. Because what we have now is that art has become very objective-oriented. 
objectively oriented. It's very formal. You ask an artist, what is your work? And they say, I'm a painter or I'm a sculptor. Well, okay, so then what are you painting and what are you sculpting? And then you get into the subject, and that's what I'm interested in. I'm not as interested in the form as I am in the sign or the picture of what that form is. You know, what it represents, what it represents. So we're now at the bottom of language. Here, these big, this, so those are little ones and they're getting larger. And then I have this city here because I have five worlds. I have the, cause, I have the subject, I have the world uh, signs, the world here I have. So that, that one is there. This one is this one. This one is the world framed. That's the world unframed. And then the elements. You see the four circles is the elements and that's at the bottom of the city plan. And then I made an anatomy where I had the same structure. So here is the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth. And then there's this thing that goes into the chest, which I think is the feelings. And then this goes up to the cosmology, which is all that stuff that's in your brain that, that really defines how you, and what you see when you look around. These are your senses, but this is what contextualizes you. Robert Berry, the famous conceptual artist, one of my favorite conceptual artworks is a piece of his where he says, he, it's a statement, and he says, everything I, I, and it's not quite these words, okay, but you get the idea. He says, everything I know, but I'm at this moment not thinking, and then he has a time and a date attached to it. So what he is, a, what he is doing is he is objectifying thought that is not current. He's objectifying the possibility of thought, and that is a sculpture. He is defining that as a sculpture. And this is in the 60s. And this is what I come after. And that, that's, that's just a genius idea. So that is, in a way, what I'm not thinking. Um, that is simply always there. So that would be above. In a cartoon, you have the thought bubble that exists in a cartoon. So what the person is thinking, there's a thought bubble above them. Well, that's the thought bubble there that's connected to his head. And here is the sign, and that's the sign like here. He's holding. This is how he communicates. And then this is his stomach, and there is his arm and his other arm, and then these are his two legs, and then his stomach goes down into the ground. So this is almost like a penis, or it could be, uh, a, a, it could be a, a con just a connection. It could be your shit. It could be your shit going down into the ground. It is your body as it is becoming part of the earth as you live your life. So that's what's happening here. And at the bottom, you have the elements. So the bottom of the chart is the elements, and at the top of the chart, you have the cosmology. And here you have them together in the anatomy, and here you have them in the city. So these are, and I was also, I made this object out of blown glass. I made blown glass anatomies, and, I've, and I made this in a supercomputer. I made a city plan in a supercomputer just uh, uh, about the same time, I started to do that, about the same time that I was working on the stone piece, um, I got a phone call from a company, Digital Productions in Los Angeles, and they wanted to know if, if I would be interested in walking inside one of my own pictures. And I said, absolutely, because I, would do, I had done that as a performance, where I was taking my mind's eye and walking into the picture. And so I started to work on this, this body of work dealing with the digital world. Uh, this is very early uh, done with a, a, a Cray supercomputer, very fancy. But this is the plan of the city that I was working with. And here, this is the city again. You have the, the subject, language, world framed, world unframed, and elements. And it's made into a pattern. This pattern <coughs> doesn't quite work. The only one that works is here, but I kind of lose it. This is one of the first representations of the pattern. And I've made wallpaper out of this. I've printed fabric with this pattern, and I'm now making tile from this pattern that one could put in their bathrooms or whatever. So that's what this is. This is the first representation of it. And it's kind of cool with the, uh, 
with the cracks coming through here and the cracks coming through here. It's interesting. Oh, and by the way, the cracks themselves, this stone piece was used by the students as a dance floor when they had parties. It was big enough to dance on and they really did have parties and, and it was really well loved because they enjoyed dancing on top of these, these insects or on top of the crystals or on top of the generator. Uh, you know, the skeleton, they, there's something nice to be walking on top of these signs. Um, and, but then what happened was a truck was doing some, probably some gardening and they didn't realize that there's no foundation. We never put a foundation underneath these stones. It's just sand. So when the truck went over it in the corners, they, it, look what happened. It all got crushed up. And, and so it's really, you can see where it happened, where the truck drove over, down over here, and that was, that was just too bad. And, uh, but except in the last, uh, uh, the last time this piece, because this, is, this piece has been in every uh, sculpture project since 87, the last time they really, I wanted to make it look like an archaeological site, uh, you know, so I had, I had the wooden taking around and, and you could really see that it had really seen better days. And that was, seemed to be interesting for me because it wasn't that long ago, but it was something that I, I, I'm still, you know, it's model, kind of model thinking. So here we have, so this is materiality and then we've got the city and then in the middle, the center, this is the middle of the whole project and it's empty. There's nothing in this stone. So it's the blank stone. So it, it creates a kind of a circular thing. And then we have the microscope and the distilling device. So the, the blowing up of the, of the elements and also the distillation of the elements. And then you have these, uh, to go along with the signs on top, this is an evolutionary chart. It's 19th, 18th, 18th, 19th century. And I, I have books, many encyclopedias from, that I have, which are facsimiles. I have some originals from the 1820s, but I was very much interested in how um, they put all the animals in a kind of a progression. So this is the more advanced and this is the more primitive and you can kind of follow the story. And here we have uh, a monkey I don't, and there's a person. Oh no, maybe not, that's not a person. There's no, just, there's no, no human being in, in, in this particular, uh, these two charts here. But it is about materiality. So now we're into this other world having to do with the bones, the distilling device, these are fossils. And this is just wonderful. I mean, as a rubbing, because, you know, the fern that's in the rock, in the rubbing, it just looks so three, for me, this is a nice surprise to see this stone. It's very beautiful to me. Uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen that. And the fact that I'm etching a, a fossil. And then you have, the, again, the four circles that exist down there, they exist there. Those two stones are identical. That one and that one, they're the same. One is facing the other way. And this goes down, this is a boiler. So that's coal on fire, heating water to make steam. And that's, again, going down to the bottom, which is the elements. The four elements, I have four circles always, always the four, and here are the four circles, the big ones. And then the four circles at the bottom there, which, the, which that is matching. And then we have crystals and rocks. <coughs> and the boiler, the boiler. And why the boiler is in this kind of pill shape, I don't know. But it's been in my work like that for 40-something 40, 40 years. Uh, I, it's something that I'm still very curious about. And it's almost like the body without the head. It, you know, it relates very much to what's happening there. And it, it, it's like almost an organism. And it's about the transference of energy, where you have the heat, that is creating steam that would be driving a wheel. Uh, uh, I was very much interested in steam engines and generators. So the transference of the boiler uh, makes enough steam to, to drive a, a generator which would make electricity. So this chain of events that would, would occur. And so then that's a kind of another very uh, different level of, 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 uh, to, the, to, the, to the human. And then you have in these pieces, in the catalog, 
I started to think that this, these four could go together, okay? One, two, three, that could be one painting. And then here, this is a painting, this could be the bottom, and it goes all the way to the top, and that's another painting. This is all one picture. And then you take all of the signs, and that six, set of six would be another painting. And then you have these four. Then you could also have this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and that. That could be a, a picture on its own. And then, of course, the evolution and the dot. And then, the, and then this one, the world here, 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 here. This, this fits very well, this line. So there are different ways of syntax, how it all fits together. And again, you know, I, I, I simply got a, a, a skeleton and I, and, I, and I traced it on a piece of stone and then I etched it. It's so elemental. And the skeleton is something, it's my body that I'm doing that with. I, when I was a, a, a younger artist and dealing with that same subject, um, I, I, I found a cadaver uh, in 1974. Um, I wanted to draw a living, uh, I wanted to draw a dead stick figure. I had come up with this idea about representation. I was interested in the life of a picture, how pictures live in us. And so I wanted to have, uh, a, I wanted to draw a real dead man. So I went out looking for a cadaver and a friend of mine was going to medical school at Yale University and he said, the, and the cadaver had been wrapped in formaldehyde, the, the head had been wrapped in formaldehyde. And he said, we've just unwrapped the head, you better get up here. So I, the next day I took an early train and I went up there and uh, because, and we've already started to cut the back of the head open. And I was most, I'm interested in the face of the cadaver more than any other part. That's where the person lies. That's where the individual is. And so that cadaver being a dead person's head, a dead person's face, uh, and, and then how we react to that. And so with the cadaver, what I did to the cadaver is I pinched his arm I covered his eyes, I shouted in his ear, I put my hand in his mouth, I slapped his face, oops, and I, and I blew the hair on the back of his, of, his, of his head. I also lifted up his skin from his chest because they'd already gone into his guts. So his guts were all um, of, 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 were out in, in the open. When we came in, he was on his stomach. And, I'm only, and you couldn't see his face. So we had to turn him over. And when we turned him over, his left arm fell off and fell on the floor because they'd already dissected the, 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 the joint. And um, at that point, I picked up the arm and put it back on the body. And then I pinched the arm to see if I, how it felt to not to hurt him. So this is, a, again, a very primal, a primal thing, and it's not so unlike the, the, the skeleton in the stone, but it was just trying to figure out the pain that he felt or he didn't feel, the fact that he was dead and trying to deal with that notion of death. When we were talking about him, we talked about how he was sad, he looked poor, he looked like he was a drunk, and then it smelled, it was crusty, it was gooey, it was, it was swishy. It had all this, because when you touched it, 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 you, it, we're all wet with this formaldehyde. So the himness and the itness of him were going back and forth in our conversation about who that was. That is the primal uh, point of the subject object split. There is always a subject object split in scope and everything. One talks about what it means and what it is. And what it is and what it means in a dead person is, and, and then and also, uh, of course, the most important is in a living person. Because we're all objects. We can all be considered objects. But we can also all be considered deities. We can all be considered the opposite of an object. We can be gods. So we have, we have the capacity to create both. And um, 
what we were doing, but, but, the, but the point of the dead man was that the dead man was a he and an it, and it was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's the two sides of this stone. That's the himness and that's the itness. And, and it's always about the subject and the object. Like in the cosmology, um, you have, I think, that up in this area is the subject. Down in this area is the elements. In this area would be the world, and in this area would be the sign. So this, but, so that, that would be, an, that's a very complex relationship between different chapters. And the chapters can, can, can coexist. They, they, they really, they really can, and that's the point of them. And, but one of the, and just looking at, uh, at these, for me, it's just, it, it, it's, it, it's a very funny feeling to be in here and talk about this work because the work is so old, and yet I'm still in it. I, I still, it's still, uh, I'm still learning from it. There are things here which I haven't seen, and I say, oh my God, that was, you know, so things are growing. Things are growing. And, and of course, it's very different when you're walking on the actual stone. When you're walking on the stone and talking about what you're standing on. That was another point. Carl Andre, you know, taught, uh, made these sculptures that he always wanted you to walk on. And I wanted to make pictures that you walk on. And that's one reason I did it this way. And I've put them in various, I did them for different institutions. After Munster, I did one in Houston, I, and, and different, and, and that was in a school context in North Carolina. And it was always interesting to walk on top of the pictures. And I never had to worry about graffiti. Because no one ever sp wants to, because it's not confronting me. It, it, it's, I'm on top of it. Uh, if, it's like when a dog gets on her, their back, they, uh, uh, and you know, don't hurt me. I, I just want to play. And this is like that a little bit. It's not, I'm not Richard Serra, and I'm not presenting you like this. I'm on my back. This is, the, the, this is on the floor. So no, I never really worried about graffiti. I worry about Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is in all of, when I, and I've done so many of these, that's the worst stuff. But it can, it can be washed out in the rain. It can, it does take time. And then also roller blades. Roller blades, I have this giant stone floor. The biggest one I've done is out at Flushing Meadows. You know that giant, there's a huge globe out at Flushing Meadows. And I did a giant stone piece about the two world's fairs. Uh, the, the 39 fair and the 64 fair. And all the rollerbladers use that to go because it's the, this is the smoothest stuff. It is absolutely glorious to, to, ro to roller skate on this material. And I'm worried about skateboarders. You know, always have to worry about skateboarders. But the image underfoot, that's, that it's not on the wall. It becomes on the wall when we have a rubbing of it. And I would love to see this piece you know, in a space because this is quite large. It would be fantastic. I gotta turn that off. Sorry. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's a fantastic, um, it would be fantastic to see it that way. But it would be, a, it's a shadow of this stone. But the shadow of the stone has a life and it does something that the stones can never do. They, they're, they're both, uh, they're both, they're both, uh, they're, they're equals in that sense. So I can answer some questions. Where is, where is, where is, where you are? Good. So I need the microphone. Okay, it's an hour. Uh, it's here. It's, it's exactly an hour. Thank <laughs> yeah. you very much, Matt, for but I, but giving I can us answer this questions. lecture. Yeah. Yes, maybe, maybe just we want to thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I want, I want to say that it's a train of thought when you see me up here, and I am held in certain lines with this stuff, but I'm very apt to, you know, I'm here and then suddenly I'm in elementary school saying nothing should, you know, like I'm, you know, I will remember this forever, and then I'm in a, in a, in a bicycle with Casper Koenig, and then I'm, you know, somewhere else. So the work, you know, it's, it's, so, I, you know, I feel a little bit funny because I, it's, it be, I think it's very meandering, but the, the, that's, how, that's how signs work. 
in a, in a funny sense. And also how dream, you know, trying to understand how dreams function and how we think and all that stuff has been in the work uh, for as long as I've been be being, you know, for the last 35, 40 years. I, I think it's very different from the site outside the museum, from the original site, having it here as a grid yes. and also having it covered so we all cannot see the stone really. Right. Uh, I think that was a really strange impression when you all came in because you couldn't see the work really. Yeah, this is so the only one that is uncovered. Only one. We so you can see how the yeah. rubbing is done. We've been in, I was here today and I had my assistants were here yesterday and, and, and it's, it's been really uh, an interesting pro process. I have a microphone with me, a portable one. So if one of you has a question, just raise your hand and I come to you. Just let me know if there is one. No questions. Maybe, no. maybe I can start with one when there okay, is. Okay, you ask a question. Is there one? No. No, no questions. Because I think it's interesting maybe to hear your impression about this change of media we have now in these, let's say, two works, in the stone work mm -hmm. and in the canvas work. So mm -hmm. maybe you can tell a bit about this, because it's, well, it's a kind canvas, of new work. They, you know, the stone work is simply the stone. Now, this stone is particular because it's all cracked. That changes the stone tremendously. It gives mm -hmm. it a history and it gives it a context, whereas the canvas is an image of the stone. It's, a, it's a, like I said, a photograph, almost like a photographic image where you can actually see the, 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 the dimensionality of the cracked stone here and then how, how, it's, how it builds up. So it's, it's, it's like the retinal image. I'm, I'm very much interested in what my eye sees in relationship to what my mind thinks. And so this is retinal image. This is like that a little bit. And uh, it's not a painting. I'm not a painter. I do do watercolors. I do these watercolors. They're small, they're in books. But this is, this is a rubbing, and yet it is on canvas, and it is stretched, and it is on the wall. So, and it looks, it is like a painting. It is a painting, but it's not, it is, you know, it's a funny thing. So it allows me to do certain things. But, uh, yeah, so we give paintings a certain, and this, the printing thing is just so, this is so beautiful, the way for me, just this is surprise of the cracks going through the, uh, the evolution is, is really sweet. And, and then I'd love to see the scale of these up, because I, at the Hangar Pekoka, I had, um, the space was uh, double this room, mm. the height, and I had paintings that were going up that high. And it was a phenomenon to go in there because you really feel it in your gut. And that, you know, that, that right there, the, the gut. And that's, that's, that's a kind of a cool thing. I remember in yeah. Milan, it was coming like directly to you it's when really, you were standing it was there. It amazing, amazing. It was a kind of immersive work then. That was. That, it was that show was very immersive, <laughs> very immersive. So, so I have a look. It's, it's quite question? difficult to see if someone wants I can to... See. Hand in a question. No. It's just fun. To, I mean, I'll just say that I was, uh, I got off the, I, I, I got on the plane this morning and I was very nervous because of the pandemic issue, but they said, no, only you need his vaccine card and then you're fine. And then I got, and I eventually got here and I got off the train here and there was the hotel that I stayed in and, and, and it's the Hotel Conti. The mm -hmm. hotel across from, that's where I stayed. And that's where I was, and that's where Fishley and Weiss was. So they were in the Conti, and in I was in the Conti. In 1987. In yeah. 87. So this is where I met all my friends, my future friends, the <laughs> German artists that I became friends with, who I'm still friends with, you know, like Thomas Schütte. I met them here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was really a sweet time for me, because I didn't get to know that many Germans. But Ludger Gerdes, uh, Harold Klingerholer, uh, 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 Thomas Schutte, um, Fischli Weiss, and um, gosh, who else was there? Because Katharina Fritsch was also no, taking She was part. there, but I, she didn't, she, no, she didn't, she, no, she was not interested. You were so many, <laughs> you were so at, many she guys. So <laughs> She's so tough. She yeah, looked at me like I, I thought she was, I thought she was like a critic, and she was looking at me like she disapproved. <laughs> She had, I was intimidated by her, for sure. 
But she when, made when, a brilliant artwork. Her piece was extraordinary. But when uh, I look back, I see there were so many guys. So that was a reason to mention her now because she's a woman. <laughs> it were, there were not so many women no, in 1987. Weren't. No, so. there weren't. Yeah. There weren't. But in my group of artists, it's dominated by women. The, the pictures generation, which is this group that I'm a part of, and that that and, and, and the pictures is obviously I use the word pictures a lot in my work, uh, and I think that's one reason that. I'm in that group, and, 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 and uh, but the women, I mean, the, the, the star of that group is Cindy. Cindy Sherman is the most famous person in the group, mm -hmm. and then there's Richard Prince, but then it's all these women, more, I mean, really, a lot of women. The next group, which is the institutional critique, and there's only a couple, but in that group, it was like, you know, from Louise Lawler to, you know, Jenny Holzer to, uh, gosh, uh, Louise Lawler, uh, 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 Sherry Levine, uh, Barbara Kruger, uh, Laurie Simmons, that whole bunch. I mean, there were just a lot of them. Erica Beckman. And, uh, but that, so uh, I was around women all the time because uh, we all hung out. And, uh, but, but Katerina Fritsch, that was another thing. I couldn't, uh, she was really <laughs> tough for me. She was, I mean, I was intimidated. That was the, that's the word. And I didn't even talk about the fact that I work with hypnosis. That's normally a, a subject that, that I talk, if I talk about myself as an artist, I talk about hypnosis and that would be in the head, in the subjective area. I hire a hypnotist and I'm entering the picture and I want to prove that Glenn exists. I want to prove that stick figures live lives. So I, that's what I was doing. That's, uh, that, that the represented image has a life on its own. To say that and to believe in it. Which is to go into, I mean, Again, you go to Hopi land, I'm going, to, I'm going to New Guinea, I'm going to, you know, wherever. It's, it's all over the world where they did this, where they manifest their, their ideas through, through objects. And they suck them in like a drug. It was all very druggy. I'm very much interested in, in uh, the way that, of course, because people ask, why don't I use, uh, why, do I, don't, why don't I use drugs? But I do use drugs, but it's, it's uh, brought in by the trance, by words. So words and pictures create the drugs. And all pictures create sensations. And, and, uh, and those sensations are like drugs. So pictures are like drugs. I mean, that's how the internet functions when you, when you really get to it. I mean, uh, when you see all these people uh, in Bucharest, I've never seen this. I mean, on the train in Bucharest, I was the only person in the car not on the iPhone. Normally in New York, there's usually like five of us, but there was not a soul. They were all on the phone itself. And they were, you know, they were doing this. They were all, all like scrolling and uh, doing this other thing. It was really interesting, but that's all in the head. That's all going in there. And it's all literal. The iPhone is literal. It wants literal information. It wants codes. You choose. How good am I? How bad am I? How good are you? How bad are you? It's all about making things rational and making things literal. So everything's become very... Abstraction is dying. And poetry is dying, I think. Hopefully there's going to be a rebound uh, for this because I think the pandemic maybe helps with the poetry a little bit. Maybe. 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 But, you know, the, but the, the, the thing is, is that my work... I was interested in entering the picture and now people are living in these iPhones. They really are. They, they, they're living in these pictures. I mean, totally. Morning, noon, and night. And my living in the picture really comes out of the television. TV. I was into cartoons when I was a child. So, Bugs Bunny, Donald Duck. I was into all of that. Mighty Mouse. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, the, the, but that's how I got into it. And then I wanted to... Uh, I was interested in when, when Glenn, the picture of Glenn, and Glenn doesn't physically exist, but when he pinches his arm, he feels pain. Mm -hmm. I'm saying the Glenn pain, the pain that Glenn feels when he pinches his arm, which is in the picture. The, represented, the representation of pain that you, as a viewer, feel with him. That's how movies work. That's how, you know, and this is elemental. I mean, stone is elemental in that way, you know. That's, that's a part of, of, of how this functions. And, and, and just to let you know, um, 
you know, I'm an American artist. I was in this show, The Sculpture Project. I was surrounded by a lot of other artists, and then a lot of people came. It was my first, not my first, but it was early uh, international show. And I was so intimidated and so scared about how, what people thought. You know, so and when people were like poo-pooing me, this is my guts out here. And you know, they, they were like, that's why it's a, stressful. It's all very stressful to do this. The sculpture project is never easy for anybody, <laughs> <laughs> for anybody. And, uh, and that's, but that was part of what it was. And uh, yeah, so that was, but it's always the good side of, of the other, of, of, of meeting these other artists and, and, and getting to know them for so many years. And then the curators, who I still know very well, you know, and they, I will always, hopefully you will know the people you worked with here, we you know, with your, your show. And that's really a good thing. Maybe we can shortly say something about the new place, where it will be placed. You can also find it in the small brochure, uh, which is accompanying the whole project. There you can see that from the place um, Matt was talking about in the chemical um, and it's, 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 it's not department. so literally up aligned with the buildings the way I did this, but it is still the same context. It's, it's the Chemistry Institute, and it's up high. No truck is going to get near it. And it has a foundation. And it's going to be used as a bench. People can sit on it and because and, 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 it's off the ground, isn't it? Yeah, like it, just, it's like, it's like a bench. It will be like, like a fundament, but more than a, than a bench. Like so, a bench. Um, 45 a centimeters bench. high. And um, so people could dance on it? Like they, a stage? They can, they can sit. I mean, in summertime, you know. They have parties. Best. It's very hot. It's about 60 to 80 degree when you sit on it and the sun <laughs> well, is shining the, on it. Well, maybe in the fall, like in November, <laughs> October, you can dance on it. Or in the spring, early spring, you know, graduation. <laughs> so, but we will place it there in the middle of August. Um, but meanwhile, maybe just for your information, you can come and see within the next days. It will completely change here. So if you have been in the museum within the last days, you have seen the stoneworks. And within the next day, um, we will bring them on the wall. So step by step within the next weeks. So if you come again, you see the completely courtyard in a different um, way. And you know, and they'll be off the floor. They'll be yeah on the wall, which is a, such a difference. Yeah. I mean, in terms of of, of of how we understand what we're, where we are. I mean, it really is the wall is a different can, can, a whole different thing than the floor. And we will do what, what you were talking about, decide which groups come together or which... Um, how we do it. Yeah, it would be would nice it. to have the height represented somewhere. It doesn't have to be the whole thing, but just that, because when you're looking, you have that going down, because then it has a, it's like a tree. It'll be like, a, it's about the size of a tree. It's pretty high. Each one of these is one meter 50. So when we, when we were being photographed, <laughs> we were all sitting at the exact, place of one meter fifty apart from each other. Yeah, we said it's a pandemic work. It's we like this. It's a pandemic work. We're perfectly meter 50. one meter fifty. <laughs> and, uh, and the one meter fifty was, that's in a way too big for a stone this size. They were being very nice with us. And the stone, um, I think it's absolute, it's Sweden. I'm not sure, because this, you could get black granite from South Africa, you can get it from Sweden, you can get it from India. And I don't think we got it from South Africa. I didn't want it from South Africa mm -hmm. because of when it was, of course. And uh, so that was, the, but it was called Absolute. I think it's Absolute, that's the name of it. And I want it to be not shiny. I mean, you see the lights there, but I didn't want it to, ref I didn't want it to be like a mirror. I, I had that, I wanted to have two tones of gray in a way, more, a little bit more subtle. And if you have a look at the brochure on the back side, you see the work, how it was um, immediately before we restored it. And it looks a bit blue, and that's because of the light. Um, it, it looks a, great. So that's the um, yeah, condition, how it because looks it had when all, it's outside. It had all the stuff growing on it, right? Didn't yeah. it have moss on it? it, had, it was, no, not moss. What, what, what was in it? It was just dirt. Just dirt? Yes. Didn't have anything, pollution. no plants growing just on pollution. it. Just pollution. Just, just pollution. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you, Matt. Oh, you're welcome.
Good. Malekin, thank you very much for being Thanks for here, coming here and, and for the artist out. lecture.